A few years ago, I created this illustration of a seal chasing a fish. Ever since, it's been on my to-do list to bring these characters to life in 3D. So, I finally decided to stop putting it off, and I opened up Blender. In this video, I'm going to walk you through my process for taking a character design and hopefully turning it into an appealing character model. Along the way, I'll be sharing a number of tips and tricks which should make your life easier when creating your own characters. Obviously, if you want to create an appealing character, it really helps to start out with an appealing design. But I want to pause things briefly to define what I mean by appeal, and it's not just cute. Obviously, appeal is highly subjective, but for something to be appealing, it's typically defined as being pleasing, attractive, or interesting. While something which is cute can also be defined as attractive, appeal is broader. A villain can be appealing, either because their design is visually interesting, or their character has interesting aspects. Taking another illustration of mine as an example, I wouldn't describe this girl as necessarily being cute, but I do feel it has appeal. The design is stylized, and you can tell what the bird is thinking, which gives it a sense of character. This brings me to what I feel is the most important element when crafting a successful image. Story. When an image lacks any sense of personality or story, it doesn't matter how well it's executed technically, the result appears soulless and it's less likely to connect with an audience. When I created this seal illustration, the story was very important to the end result. The seal isn't trying to eat the fish, it just wants to play, but the fish definitely doesn't see it that way. The first thing that I do before I start any project is gather reference. This may involve searching online, but wherever possible, I like to shoot my own reference photos or video. The quality of this doesn't need to be amazing, but getting to see how your subject moves in the real world can be really informative. Even if you're working from someone else's design, the more that you understand the subject, the easier it will be to translate a 2D image into 3D. Something that I also like to do is sketch from my reference. This helps me to get a better understanding of the forms that I'll be working with and how those shapes can be simplified as I start to work on the design. When I start to model a character like this, the first thing that I do is block in the basic shape with the smallest amount of detail possible. This helps me to focus on the overall form of the character rather than getting bogged down in details too quickly. Initially, I just use Blender's basic modeling tools to extrude and add edge loops as required, whilst dragging around the vertices to define the shape. You'll notice that I haven't created front or side views of the character design to use as a reference in the 3D viewport. These can often be extremely helpful, but due to the overall simplicity of the design, I decided to work directly from the posed illustration, which I have open on the second screen for reference. The other thing that you'll notice as I start to model the character is that I'm not worrying about the pose at all for now. Instead, I'm modeling the character in a neutral pose, and I'll add a rig to enable me to pose it later. This has the benefit of keeping the modeling process simple, whilst also making it easier to reuse the model for a future animation. Something else which I try to do at this stage is to keep the main body parts separate. Not only does this simplify the initial modeling process, but it makes it quicker and easier to reposition or resize elements as required. After the main forms are blocked out, I jump into sculpting mode and start to refine the overall form. I'm still keeping the resolution as low as possible to concentrate on the main shapes. Since the eyes will be an extremely important part of the overall design and appeal of the character, I try to get these in place early on. After roughly positioning the eyeballs and adding some basic shaders, I enable dynamic topology so that I can place and sculpt the eye sockets. There are a number of possible approaches to creating the simple cartoon style eyes of this design. But for this model, I decided I was going to use large spherical eyes and try to create a simple oval shaped socket. In reality, getting the shape to work well from all angles while staying true to the design was one of the hardest elements of translating the design into 3D, and I returned to the eyes frequently to tweak them and achieve the most appealing shape. Once I was happy with the basic proportions of the face, I disabled dynamic topology and remeshed the sculpt to give an even geometry to continue working with. I then smoothed out and refined the overall form of the character. For this, I'm primarily using just the grab and smooth brushes. Moving on to the front flippers, once again, I rough out the form with a low resolution mesh, only increasing the density of the geometry when required to add more detail. Since the flippers are still separate meshes, 
I've instanced the geometry so that changes made to one flipper are reflected on the other. Obviously the same result could be achieved with a mirror modifier. I took exactly the same approach with the rear flippers by roughing in the form and gradually increasing the detail. I did make a mistake here though and I'll be returning to fix this later. With the main sculpt working fairly well, I decided to open the mouth and roughly sculpt in the nose. Unfortunately, whilst opening the mouth, I managed to deform the overall muzzle shape into something far less appealing. At this point, I was still trying to decide how to best capture the look of the eyes, and with the muzzle still looking bad, I decided to compound the issues by sculpting detailed eyelids onto the character. This started to take everything in a very unappealing direction, and even once I'd softened out the eyelids somewhat, I still wasn't liking the result. Next, after combining the body and fins into a single mesh by joining them and remeshing, I decided to add the tongue and teeth to better define the look of the mouth. These were just box modelled with simple low resolution geometry and a subdivision modifier. With the teeth and tongue in place, I returned to the eyes and muzzle, smoothing things out and creating more appealing shapes and proportions. During this process, I switched to using different matte caps as I'm sculpting in order to better see the underlying form. I continually rotate the sculpt, checking everything from multiple angles, and making small adjustments to ensure that the silhouette looks good from all directions. It was at this point that I really felt I was getting somewhere and starting to create a face which looked more appealing. Comparing this stage back to the earlier results, there's a stark difference which highlights the importance of keeping going even when things aren't looking great. Small, subtle adjustments gradually build up to create a more pleasing result. Thinking that I was almost done, I continued refining details across the sculpt, softening some elements and sharpening others in order to create visual interest in an otherwise smooth and simple form. After taking a break and returning to the sculpt, I realised I completely missed something with the rear flippers. They simply weren't looking right. Since the flippers are not open in my design, I realised that I'd made assumptions about their construction rather than double checking my reference. I completely reworked them to better reflect the way real flippers look and after adjusting the size, I was far happier with the end result. Just goes to show that even when we think we know how something should look, it always pays to keep an eye on the reference, regardless of how much we may be simplifying or stylizing our designs. It's not about being realistic as such, it's simply easier to create a believable design if it's grounded in reality. At this point, I could have gone ahead and posed the sculpt for the final render, but since I wanted to be able to animate this character in the future, I decided to retopologize the model first. Likewise, because I'll be animating, I chose to do the retopology manually rather than using an automatic plugin. This gives me far more control over the final mesh, even if it is a much more time consuming process. I start by defining the areas around the eyes and mouth to ensure that they can articulate properly. You'll notice that some of the edges are red here. This is because I've marked them as seams this is purely to be used as a visual marker whilst I construct the geometry. It helps me to see how different edges of the mesh relate to each other, so that I can ensure I have sufficient detail for deformation. Once I'm happy with the geometry, I'll unmark these edges as seams, so that they don't interfere with the process of defining UVs later. With the main landmarks of the face defined, the rest of the head is really just a big jigsaw puzzle, as I connect the individual islands together, trying to keep the edge flow as clean as possible. The rest of the body comes together quickly and easily, since it's a very simple form, with only the details of the flippers requiring a little more work to define. Once the retopology is complete, I'll start to mark seams so that I can unwrap the mesh and create UV coordinates for texturing. In the shader editor, I add an image texture node and change its generated type to UV grid. This allows me to check how well the UVs are working and how much stretching there is likely to be on any textures. I resize some of the individual UV islands for a more even distribution, but overall the default unwrap works well. I next jump into painting the textures. For this, I make use of Blender's texture painting to block in the initial colours. Once I'm happy with this base layer, I then save out the image texture and open it up in Photoshop. Whilst painting textures is far easier in a 3D environment, I wanted to have access to layers in my Photoshop brushes in order to create the pattern on the seal's back. The main issue with doing this work in software like Photoshop though, is that it's far harder to handle the seams of the texture nicely. For this, I brought my texture back into Blender to blend the seams and fix some other small issues. 
Since the fish is a far simpler character, I used box modeling to define the body. Once I was happy with the overall shape, I decided to create the eyes using planes, which are then shrink wrapped onto the body. This is a very quick and simple solution for creating a cartoony style eye whilst maintaining a simple body shape. The fins were also box modeled and I chose to model the spines within them rather than relying on textures for these. Once positioned, I then used Blender sculpting tools to further refine the shape of the fins. This time, I fully textured the fish within Blender since I didn't need the same level of detail and all I was really doing was painting a simple gradient. Whilst I could have achieved a similar result procedurally, I liked the more hand-painted feel that this created. The next step was to start rigging the seal. I began by placing a bone which would act as the main torso control, before creating chains for the neck, head and spine. For the flippers, I added three chains, which I felt would probably be sufficient to create believable deformation. At this point, I decided not to add a face rig beyond a jawbone and controls for the eyes. This is something that I'd need to refine later before animating the character, but the basic controls were sufficient to pose the character for a still render. I parented the teeth and tongue to the jawbone, and the whiskers to the headbone so that they'd follow along with the motion of the rig. Parenting the geometry to the rig with automatic weights gave a good starting point, but the weights still needed a little refinement, especially around the jaw, and also the chest area where the shoulders, chest and spine all need to influence similar parts of the geometry. Once I was generally happy with the weights, I decided to move ahead and start posing the character, since this is always the best way to truly identify any issues with the weight painting. As I was posing the seal, I quickly realised that I was getting some undesired creasing, but I decided to continue with creating the pose before adjusting anything, so that I'd have the clearest idea of what needed to be fixed. Just as I was about to try and adjust the weights, I realised that I'd made a basic error. I simply needed to reorder my modifiers so that the armature was above the subdivision modifier in the stack. This instantly smoothed everything out and I was able to continue refining my pose without any further weight adjustments. In exactly the same way as I would work when creating a key pose for an animation, I adjusted the character so that everything worked well to camera, with a silhouette that was clear and a pose with a nice clean line of action. This can take a while and shouldn't be rushed as very small adjustments can make a big difference to the appeal of the final pose. Obviously the pose was based upon my illustration, but I also took the time to improve things that weren't quite as strong in the original. The front flipper especially was reworked, so that it felt more like the seal was stretching forward, and I repositioned the fish to work better with the pose. These relatively small adjustments helped to create a far more dynamic image. When I started the project, I did wonder if I'd need to maybe add a blend shape and partially sculpt the character into a final pose, which matched the illustration. So I was very pleased that I was able to not only match the pose, but improve upon it with the rig alone. The next step was to work on the environment. After adding some basic spheres as bubbles, I moved on to the rock. Once again, I blocked out the basic form with low resolution geometry, before gradually adding detail where required. Once the main form was in place, I switched to sculpt mode to more easily adjust the overall shape. The surfacing of the rock was all created with procedural shaders. I layered up noise textures in order to create the blotchy colours and the more detailed bump texture. One thing which is important with the environment is that it should support the rest of the image and not distract from the characters. With this in mind, I made sure to keep the contrast between the colours relatively low. The seagrass was really fun to create. For this, I used a bezier curve with a second curve which defined its profile. Once the first strand was set up and I created its shader, I was able to simply enter edit mode and use the draw curve tool to sketch out additional grass strands. I then selected the top vertices and scaled them in using the Alt S shortcut to define the tips. I continued adding clumps of seagrass of different lengths to roughly match the original illustration. Each strand was then carefully adjusted to create a pleasing overall look which supported the characters and didn't adversely obscure their silhouettes. At this point I decided to finalise the lighting for the scene. I'd already created a three point lighting setup using large area lights and whilst I was really happy with how this was looking on the characters, it wasn't really working well for the environment. Initially I tried to darken the foreground using a light with a negative value, but to get greater control I decided to make use of light linking. The original set of area lights were used for the characters, 
and I created a duplicate set for the environment elements. This way, I can make small adjustments to both the power and the angle of the environment lights to better light those elements, whilst the overall effect of the lighting remain consistent. To make it simpler to define which elements were affected by the lights, I created collections for the characters and environment, and then linked these collections to the lights, rather than individual objects. This way objects could be moved between collections to rapidly change which lights they were affected by. Once I was happy with the lighting, I split the seagrass into three main groups, defining the foreground, midground, and background. Each group was then given a different shader to help create a stylized sense of depth. I also significantly reduced the colour saturation across all of the seagrass so that it didn't draw too much attention and it allowed the character to remain the clear focus. At this point, I already had an image which closely replicated the original illustration, but I decided it would be fun to expand the environment slightly and add a few additional details. I created a plane to define the sand and added a soft fall off to the shader to create an illustrative look. I then modelled some simple pebbles which I scattered around the scene placing them in ways which felt both natural and pleasing to the eye. I thought that it might be nice to also add some starfish to the rock, so starting out with a five-sided cylinder, I quickly box modelled the basic shape before creating a simple procedural shader. I then used the sculpting tools to wrap the arms of the starfish around the rock and ensure that it looked as though it was contacting firmly and appeared natural. Once the starfish were in place, I realised that the colour of the shader was too saturated and was drawing the eye so I adjusted it to better blend with the rest of the environment. Again, the extra elements are meant to help create a believable world for the characters, which shouldn't ever draw the eye from the focus of the shot. Next, I decided to create a simple model of a limpet to add some additional detail to the rock. In this case, I modeled the outside of the shell and then added a solidify modifier for thickness. Once again, I used procedural shaders to create the stripe pattern on the shell before scattering a few of the limpets around the rock to finalize the scene. So, at this point, all that remained was to animate some cameras and render out the end result. I had a lot of fun creating this scene, and I really hope that you've enjoyed this brief look into my process. If you'd like a more in-depth explanation of my character creation or animation process, be sure to check out my courses, which are available at intoanimation.com. Above all, I hope that this video inspires you to open up Blender and start creating some appealing characters.